Hello and welcome to the online tutorial for the Quality Performance Assessment and Support System, or QPASS. I'm Bill Tullock, I'm an NCQA employee, and I was the operations lead on the team that put the QPASS system together. Today we're going to walk you through the process of enrolling and signing up for one of our programs, but first I want to talk a little bit about the sign-in page you see before you. We've got a lot of new resources for you to choose from, including, of course, the sign-in option, a place to learn about our programs, including PCMH, a questionnaire for new customers to find out if they're eligible for the PCMH program, and also if they're ready to begin the transformation process, a price calculator to determine likely fees, a way to contact NCQA with questions, and a link to the educational resources on our website. But since we're talking about enrollment and signing up here, we're going to start with the sign-in page. So to sign into QPASS, click the Sign in and Enroll button here. That will bring you to the Sign In page. Notice that your NCQA account is your email address. NCQA has moved to a one user ID system, which means if you've bought a publication from us, signed up for one of our courses, or asked a question through the my.ncqa.org system, you actually already have an account in QPASS using your email address and password. If you don't remember your password, click I forgot my password, and you'll see this page where you can enter your email prove you're not a robot through the CAPTCHA system, and then it will help you reset your password at that point. If you're not sure if you have an account, or if you know you don't have one, click Create One Here. The first thing you'll be asked to do is put in your email address, and I want to show you that if I put in an email address, as I already have, that has an account associated with it, the system will alert me to that, so it won't let me recreate an account with the same address. I'll just click here to reset my password if necessary, or I can just go back and sign in. I'm actually going to show you how the sign-in works now by putting in my email address. I've already saved my password so it pops up and click sign in to enter the system. Now I want to show you what happens uh, if you do have an existing NCQA account. You will have to register for the first time uh, that you enter into the QPASS system. So uh, notice here I'm going to log in with another account and it tells me as you notice that I already have an account, but I do have to register. So I go to create one here. My account appears. I put my password in. I then put all the information that it asks for. I'll use the NCQA address. And I will register in the system. Notice it automatically logs me in, and it brings me to the license agreement. The first time you log into the QPASS system, you'll see the license agreement. Like most websites, you'll have to scroll through it and actually accept the license agreement. But what's new for the QPASS system is that once you accept the license agreement, you won't have to again unless we update it. Under our old system, because user IDs were not tied to email, we had you accept the license agreement every time you signed in. This is a modification and an improvement, we think, to this new system. When you log in for the first time, you'll be taken to the My Organizations page. Notice it tells you you don't have any organizations yet. Um, if I had organizations, and if I had organizations with current evaluations, they would appear on the My Evaluations tab. But for right now, I don't have any organizations, so I'm going to create one by clicking on this link. When you're creating a new organization, you're going to put the name of the organization in this search box first. If the organization exists, the system will find a match, and if you're the contact for the match, you'll be able to claim it. Otherwise, it'll tell you that your organization does not match any results, and you'll be able to create a new organization. So I'm going to highlight the name of my organization, and I'm going to copy it down here. I'm also going to make that the same organization display name. You could also do a different display name if you have a DBA uh, situation going on. I'm going to put in the organization address, again using the NCQA address. A five-digit zip code is required. And a tax ID number is required, but this does not do any kind of verification. If you're a HRSA grantee, you should also put in your H code uh, for your organization. And then click Done. So once you've created your organization, you'll come to something called the Organization Dashboard. And you can see the name of my organization is up in the header, as well as being here where I can edit information about my site. The only options I have at this point are to enroll in programs, uh, manage people in roles, go back to the educational resources page that we uh, already looked at, or to get help. I'm going to show you how to add users, 
uh, to your organization. Notice that the uh, individual that signed in the organization is automatically listed as an organization administrator. An organization administrator can add users to a, a site, can enroll in programs, can add evidence to programs, can basically do everything. You can also create people in a contributor role, which will allow them to add data and upload evidence to a program, but wouldn't let them change the organization information or add or, or delete new users. I want to show you, though, how to add a new person if you are an org administrator. Uh, the first thing you're going to do is, is, is search for an email address to see, does this person already have an NCQA account? In this case, yes, that person does. This could be, for instance, uh, one of our uh, consultants or a consultant you're working with, and you want to add them to the organization. So just uh, add new person, and then you'll see that they automatically are created as a contributor. I can, as an organization administrator, change their rights. So I can make them an organ administrator and update uh, their role, and you'll see that person is now also an organization administrator. You can have more than one, but you always must have one org administrator. Once you've added a user to your account for your organization, you can then make that person a contact. So go back up to edit your organization details. And if you scroll to the bottom, notice we set up the original user as the primary contact by default, but we can also set a secondary contact or change the primary contact. To do that, that person must already be in your list of users. And it brings up that person immediately. And again, if this is my consultant, I can set them as the contact. You do have to submit for approval, which means NCQA has to uh, approve the change before it will be updated in our system. But that normally takes about one business day. So of course, the most important thing you'll want to do is enroll your organization in some programs. So first, click on the Enroll My Organization button. And you'll see that we only have one option right now, which is the patient-centered medical home. But before we enroll, I want to show you something. Notice it has a question up here, how to enroll a site into a program. If you click on this button, the instructions will expand, and you'll be able to follow those through to actually enroll in a program. Rather than creating a very complex user guide, we thought this was an easier and more direct way to provide instructions for users. If you don't need them, click the button again, and they'll go away. To enroll sites in a program, pick the program in which you'd like to enroll the sites and click on the button. The first thing you'll get is a page that gives you the distinction between single-site organization and multi-site organization. This is informational only, and if you do have uh, more than three practice sites, we'll ask you a series of questions during enrollment to determine if you get single-site or multi-site pricing. Once you're finished reading this, just click Begin Enrollment. The enrollment process is step-by-step, -step, and you can follow along at the top to see where you are in the, in the process. To move to the next step, click Next. To move to the previous step and correct something, click Back. Notice I cl can't click Next right now because I haven't actually done the step that I need to on this page. This is the page where you actually add sites to enroll in the PCMH. Notice again we have the accordion instructions giving you all kinds of hints as to how to get through this part of the enrollment process. But the first thing you'll have to do is select the sites you're going to enroll. Notice right now I have no sites. If I were an existing organization, my sites would have shown up here. But because I'm a new organization, I have to create a new site. To add a site, you must enter the site's NPI number. You have to enter a valid NPI, so I'm actually using a true site's NPI, but I'm going to actually change the name of the site. I then enter its address and also its tax ID number. You must pick a specialty for the site. In this case, I'm going to make it a pediatric site. Um, and if you have a sponsor code, that is, if you're part of an initiative that gets a discount from NCQA, you can enter that sponsor code here, or you can do it later when we actually create an invoice for your program. Now, I've added two more sites to this organization, so I can show you what happens when you enroll more than one site in the PCMH program. My sites are listed here, and I, as the instructions tell me, I should select the sites I want to enroll. I can select them individually, or I can simply hit all or none, and then click next. Because I have three sites or more, the system is asking me two questions. First, does my organization have an EHR system used across the three sites? I'm going to answer yes. And also, does my organization, or the, do the practice sites at least, share policies and procedures uh, for things outside the EHR system? I'm going to say yes to that as well. When I submit, it will tell me, in fact, well, it will give me multi-site pricing. If you don't answer yes to both those questions, you'll get single-site pricing. So it's important to note that you want to have, if you are a multi-site, you want to have three or more sites listed uh, when you enroll. Because two of my sites are in Massachusetts, I can also choose to enroll them in the Massachusetts 
PCMH Prime program, uh, which is an additional distinction program on top of PCMH only for sites in Massachusetts. The third step in the process is to set up your clinicians. Remember that the cost of the PCMH program is based on your clinician count, so you'll only want to include primary care clinicians, which are MDs, DOs, NPs, and PAs that both manage a panel of patients and provide primary care for 75% or more of their patients. Don't include other clinicians listed at the site. To manage clinicians, click Manage Clinicians, and then you'll notice that you can either add a new clinician, add an existing clinician from your organization, or you can choose to import clinicians if you have a large number. To import clinicians, you'll actually have to download an Excel spreadsheet where you'll include the clinician information and then import that back in the system. I'm just going to add one clinician, and again, I have to have a valid uh, NPI, but I'm going to change the clinician's name. And I also have to put in their date of birth. Whoops, I didn't do it right, so it warned me. I've got to put in the appropriate date function. I also have to add their credentials. Email address if they'd like to get information from NCQA. Uh, their license number. And the state where that license comes from. Although the NPI has this uh, database has this information, we ask you to update this to make sure that it's accurate. If that clinician is going to be attesting to maintenance of certification by using the PCMH program, you should click here. And you also have to add a specialty for each clinician. And if they're board certified, you'll have to note that. If they're not, click NA. Save the board and specialty, and then you save the clinician. What I've done is I've added two more clinicians to my family site, uh, family health site A. I want to show you what happens if you have clinicians that operate at more than one site and you need to add them to each of the sites. So when I go to manage clinicians for site B, I can add an existing clinician and notice I have the clinician names and their license numbers. So those two clinicians work at this site as well. And then if I go to site C, I can add different clinicians. So if your organization has a large number of clinicians, it may be easier to use the import and then simply select them as you do uh, here for each site. After you've added your clinicians, the next step is to sign the legal agreements. There are two legal agreements that have to be signed, the agreement for the PCMH program and the business associate agreement. These can be e-signed very simply. Click view sign agreement. The first question that will be asked is, are you an authorized user to actually, for this organization, to sign an agreement? So I'm going to say I am, and then I'm going to click to sign. It will come up as a PDF, and if you scroll down to the bottom, uh, you can of course read through it, uh, but you'll add your title, and then you'll indicate you've read the agreement, and click to e-sign. It's just that simple. Close out of here and notice it is now signed. What happens if you're not the authorized user? What if you're someone who can't sign? Well, you, you click no, and then you can actually fill out the information for the individual who should be signing the agreement. Once you've done that, you click submit authorized representative information, and the system will actually generate an email to that individual asking them to go back into the system and actually sign the agreement. If they have an existing user account with NCQA, it will in fact tell them that they have an account and how to reset their password. If they don't have an account, it will set one up and then ask them to register when they go in to sign the agreement. So it's a great system to allow you to indicate to someone else that they need to sign the agreement. But in this case, I'm going to go back just for ease of use and say that I am the authorized person. I will put in my uh, title again, and this is what an authorized user would have to do and sign that agreement, and then click Close. And then click Next for the final stop. The final step in the process is to generate the invoices and to actually pay the program fees. Notice at the bottom you have an invoice for each site. You can create and pay them one by one if you want to, or you can actually create them all at once and bundle them together. To create an invoice, just click on Create Invoice. And then you have a couple of options. You can pay or you can cancel. If I had wanted to bundle and I realized that I, I shouldn't have clicked on that, I could actually cancel the, cancel the invoice at this point. I will tell them, yes, I'm sure I want to cancel. And I can go back and bundle them all together again. And a lot of organizations are going to want to bundle. Once I've bundled, I can then pay the invoice. We have an online payment system. 
So you accept the terms, enter your name, and then it will give you all this information. You can put in your credit card number and, uh, and submit payment that way. If you don't want to pay online by credit card or by e-check, which is the other option for an online payment, you can generate the invoice that I previously showed you, and then you can pay offline uh, via a check sent to NCQA. Please note, you will not be able to actually begin doing your evaluation until you actually pay. Now, what if you're a part of an initiative that gets a discount from NCQA? Well, there are two places you can put the discount code, which actually identifies uh, the discount that that initiative is eligible for. You can apply the discount code when you create a site, or you can do it at invoicing right here. So notice there's an apply discount option. I'm going to put in a discount code. In this case, this discount code takes $20 off of the cost of the review. So notice both of these sites that haven't yet been invoiced uh, now show a discount of $20 and their uh, total balance is $180 versus $200 as it was before. So how do you get a discount code like this? Well, you have to actually be part of an initiative where the sponsor will give you the discount code. And CQA doesn't give those out because we want the sponsors to be responsible for determining who is eligible to actually get the discount. So if you think you're eligible, check first with the sponsor. You may also want to check with NCQA where we can verify whether or not there is a discount available, but you'll have to go back to the sponsor to get the code. As a final step in enrollment, you'll review the program you're actually enrolling in, how many sites, whether your agreements are signed, and then the next steps. So if you haven't paid your invoices, do that. Check your email to get your NCQA representative assignment. You can also set up site groups if you have more than uh, one organization and you want to share evidence across them. That's what you would want to do. You can transfer credits if you've got pre-validated vendors. You can determine which of the criteria are going to be shared across your sites. And you can also add more staff and users to your organization and to your practice sites. Once you complete enrollment, you'll be taken back to the organization dashboard, which also now has a handy dandy guide because it is a little bit more complex at this point, and you continue on in your PCMH journey. So if you're an existing user with NCQA and you believe you have an organization that's already been recognized or for some reason should be in our system, when you go in to claim an organization, you click on this button and you'll type in the, the organization's name. Now I'm going to type in Kaiser, which is one of our larger customers, and I'm going to pretend that I'm part of the military and part of the Kaiser Schlotten site. So I click on that, I scroll back up to the page because this is my organization and I would like to claim it. I scroll back up the page and notice it tells me that although the organization exists, I am not listed as an authorized user. Now there may be a few reasons for this. There may have been a, a corruption of the user file, or you may have never been added to the organization as an appropriate user. At that point, you can claim your organization, but first we need to verify in person some information. So we're going to ask you to contact customer support. Click on that link, and you'll be brought to the myncqa.org website. Notice it's already trying to log me in. And then I can ask a question and go up to my questions and then type in a new question here where I would ask about a program. And I would put my question here to ask NCQA to verify that I'm an appropriate user and either add me to the organization. If NCQA needs uh, further information, they will contact you uh, to make sure that you are in fact an authorized user before adding you to the account. Once you're added to the account, when you come back into the uh, QPASS system, when you go to My Organizations, it will be there. So it will be listed here under the organization website. Once you've claimed an organization, of course you can go and enroll it in a program, but there's a few other options. One of the things you can do is if you're confused by anything, you can ask NCQA a question. This is actually the my.ncqa.org system, but notice it's automatically logging you into recognition programs and the program you're in, which is PCMH uh, 2017. You can then provide uh, context for your question. Is it a content question where you're asking about one of our concepts? Are you asking about some of the other options? Are you asking a system question? Uh, do you have a technical issue? Um, do you have a pre-validation question? Would it, whichever one you want, uh, you can actually put in there. And so let's say I have a technical issue, and the subject is uh, uh, screen freezing. So let's say I'm having a problem with my screen freezing. I'll put in a test question here, and then I would submit it to NCQA 
and it will go into our PCS system and you'll get a response in one to two business days. Now if your organization has a representative assigned, the question will go automatically to the representative. Otherwise it will go through our normal triaging system uh, and go to an appropriate NCQA staff person to answer your question. We also have a lot of resources available right here on the website. So if you click on Get Help, you'll see there's a whole list of things that you can pick from. If you're looking for one of the file templates, for instance, if you want to upload a lot of clinicians or a number of sites, those templates are available here and you can download them. Uh, and these, of course, accordion open and close this way our instructions do. There's a checklist for enrollment. There are some videos on navigating QPASS. There's also a video on an overview of the transformation process. Uh, there's some other information about basic documents, standards overview, um, all kinds of resources that you can access right here from the content uh, before you even have to ask a question. So now we'd like to actually show you how you can start to work with your sites and actually provide evidence for your evaluations. The first thing we want to do is actually show you the transfer credit or pre-validation options. Uh, this is the organization dashboard for an organization that I've created called Test PCMH. This is in our uh, training site, but this is exactly as you would do it in our regular QPASS site. And what you want to do is you want to click on transfer credits if you believe you have a sponsor that has, or excuse me, not a sponsor, but a vendor that has uh, pre-validation. That is, they've been previously reviewed by NCQA um, and have uh, uh, gotten some uh, credit for certain features of their systems already. So we're going to use a test. Uh, option and we're going to actually assign all three sites uh, they all use the same system and then we actually have to prove to NCQA that we uh, have implemented these systems so that uh, we can actually get the credit that the vendors received when they did their pre-validation so the first thing I need to do is add um, a document so I'm going to click to browse and I'm going to go to some documents I've already put together and we're going to pretend that this document is the document we need. Um, and what that means is that I would submit that to NCQA for review. Uh, so what, what I'm saying to NCQA is I have these systems. This is the letter that proves that I've implemented them for at least 90 days. Uh, NCQA will review that item. And then uh, once the uh, representative uh, approves it, uh, the sites will get credit for the criteria that the uh, vendor has already been pre-approved for. So once your NCQA representative looks at the documentation you've provided from the vendor showing, yes, in fact, you have implemented the system, when you go back into transfer credit, it will actually tell you for all these sites the review is complete. And then if you actually go to the um, uh, one of the site evaluations, we're going to go to site A, and we're actually going to look at uh, their evaluation. The criteria that uh, the uh, vendor got credit for is AC07. So if I go to the evaluation, for this practice, that's access. Um, that's our access co uh, concept, AC. And I actually look at the criteria for AC. You will see it's actually already been met. So as a practice, I don't have to do anything else. NCQA has reviewed my, my pre-validation. This uh, criteria has already been met, and that will actually show up in my preliminary results. So I've already gotten credit. In this case, it's an elective cre uh, criteria, so I get one credit toward the 25 that I need uh, for recognition. So I'm done with that uh, requirement. So I'm back on my organization dashboard, and I want to begin my evaluation for those items that I want to provide evidence for. So the first thing I want to do is go to my sites. So I manage sites. Again, I see all three sites. Uh, and I, what I'm going to want to do is actually start with site A. And I'll show you exactly how you're going to add evidence uh, to uh, each of the sites. So you go to site A, view details. And when the site information comes up, you go to manage evaluations. It shows that there's one transformation evaluation happening and I go straight to the evaluation. The evaluation instructions, of course, are uh, like most of our pages shown at the top, so I can find out about my evaluation, what the process is going to entail. In fact, there's three reviews. There's going to be a virtual review. Uh, but to start, the real place I want to start is on the PCMH criteria, which are right here. And it, when I click on that, it opens up. I can look at all the criteria. I can look at the core criteria. I can look at the elective criteria by concept or all the elective criteria together to decide where I want to get my credit. Let's start with the core criteria, uh, and that's where really, most of you will want to begin your evaluation.
So as you can see, the core criteria are broken out into the six concepts, and you can really start where uh, ever your practice uh, has the most uh, evidence ready or where you've been sort of doing things the, the longest. Uh, in this case, we're going to start with access. Uh, this is actually patient-centered access and continuity, AC. You can see that there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven core criteria. They are not consecutively numbered because the criteria are, are put into an order that makes sense in terms of operations, uh, but the other uh, numbers here, AC uh, six, seven, eight, eight, nine, et cetera, those are elective and so they're not going to be shown on this page. Uh, I'm going to select the uh, criteria that I want to work on, in this case, access needs and uh, preferences, uh, and it tells me that the requirement is that uh, the practice has to assess the access needs and preferences of their patient population. As with most criteria, there are two facets to this. There's a documented process and evidence of implementation. So let's think about the documented process first. I'm going to click on that. It's going to tell me the suggested evidence, which is a documented process for the reporting year, which means basically instructions for your staff. You might call these policies and procedures, standard operating procedures. Um, it might be flow charts, things like that. It's basically any instructions for your staff, in this case, on how to assess access needs and preferences from your patient population. So uh, assuming that I do uh, actually do this and I'm going to be able to meet the core, the first thing I want to do is, is add evidence. Now there are two options here. I can link evidence, that's evidence that already exists, or I can add new evidence. In this case, since, since I'm just beginning, I don't have any evidence, so again I'm going to uh, go to uh, look on my system and I'm going to bring up an item that will be documentation. In this case, it's a handbook that allows, uh, tells my practice staff how to do this assessment of access needs and preferences. If that's the only evidence that uh, I want to add, I can uh, save that. And notice the criteria changes a little bit. I can now, uh, since I have evidence attached, I can open that evidence. So if I'm a different staff person coming in wanting to see, well, what did they attach here? I can open look at it. I can find out the details uh, about it. I can also add comments for the reviewer so I may say this is a long document start on page 10 or something like that. I can also unlink if I realize that this evidence is wrong or if I suddenly realize that we've inadvertently provided PHI I can flag it right here. I'm not going to do that right now. If I were to it would actually delete the item uh, or the, the evidence directly from the system automatically and then it would flag this as something uh, practice has to go back to uh, in order to add evidence that doesn't have the PHI. Uh, with most documented processes you're not going to have PHI so it shouldn't be uh, something that you're going to have to do very often but we do have that option there. Uh, what if you have different evidence? If you don't have the suggested evidence, well, you can click uh, this item and you can again add new evidence or link evidence. So this may be if you have some kind of reporting or, or some other uh, uh, items that we did not uh, expect to see, uh, you can use the different evidence option there. Once I'm actually uh, done with this uh, documented process and this is all I need to do, I've added my evidence, I'm done, I can click it as ready for check-in. And that is the equivalent, if you think about a, an online shopping uh, site, uh, as putting something in your cart. You haven't checked out yet, but you've indicated that this is ready for check-in. If you come along later and say, oh, no, I shouldn't have done that, you can uncheck it, and again, um, uh, you'll be able to work on that aspect of the criteria. Now what about the evidence of implementation uh, for the same uh, criteria? So I have my documented process, but I also need to prove to NCQA that I'm actually doing this assessment. So my evidence of implementation, I'm going to open that, uh, that item. And notice again, I have the same options in terms of link evidence or add new evidence, but I also have this option of doing a virtual review. That is not available under the documented process. That's because we expect a documented process to be something that we want our evaluator to read ahead of time, uh, rather than doing it during the virtual review when you're going to be on the phone and sharing your computer screen with the evaluator. We don't want them reading documents uh, during, that, during that time period because we only have two hours during that virtual review and we want to be able to get uh, through the, the evidence that you're actually doing things rather than read your processes. So we're going to have you upload any documented processes ahead of time, but for the evidence of implementation, for the most part, we're, we're expecting these to be done during virtual reviews. So you would click and say, we're going to do a virtual review and either tell the re reviewer that you're going to show them a demonstration of your system, or in this case, since it's an assessment of access needs and preferences, I probably have a report I'm going to show uh, the, the evaluator. And again, once, I'm, uh, once I know I'm going to do a virtual review, I can click it as ready for check-in. It says who actually checked in and when, so you can see which of your staff has done this. And again, if both uh, the documented process and the evidence are ready, uh, then they're both ready for check-in. And again, that's the equivalent of putting an item in your shopping cart, but not yet checking out.
So we've checked in this criteria. Let's go back and look at another AC criteria. So I'm going to look at my same-day appointments. This is a pretty important aspect of the medical home. Again, I have to provide a documented process, and I have to provide evidence of implementation. So let's say that handbook that I already attached is, in fact, the handbook for all of my documented processes. Well, rather than adding that again, because I've already added it, I can link it to this uh, criteria as well. And notice, if I just start to search any aspect of the title, any word within the title, it shows up. So I can say, I want to attach the same thing here. Again, I can open it, I can unlink it, or I can flag it with PHI. What's missing here are the details. That's only going to show up the first time you add a piece of evidence to criteria. So uh, once you've added it to one criteria, though, you can always link it to another one. Uh, again, I can say that we're ready for check-in. If you need help with an item, you can click We Need Help, and that will actually send an alert to your representative uh, that you have a question, and they will contact you uh, or have one of our managers contact you if it's a content issue. Uh, if you cannot meet a criteria, uh, that actually automatically sets it to not met. Now, this is a core criteria, so you have to meet it. You don't really want to be selecting that for this criteria, but uh, that might be applicable for an elective where you try to meet it, uh, you realize you can't, and so you basically are taking it off the table. Uh, if something's not applicable, you can also click that, but you have to provide evidence of the not applicability. So this may be something like uh, we are uh, a pediatric practice and this is not applicable for pediatricians. In this case, that doesn't apply. Uh, or again, you can say it's ready for check-in. Uh, evidence of implementation is another requirement here. So uh, just as with uh, the other criteria, um, I'm going to do a virtual review here. I'm going to do a demonstration of the system. Because it's scheduling and it's same-day appointments, I'm just going to show the, the evaluator what our schedule looks like, where the same-day appointments are, and how we fill them. And again, that's ready for check-in. And we can go on to another criteria. Now, what if you're a uh, currently recognized practice, either under the 2011 standards or under the 2014 standards level one or two? Well, you actually still have to go through this transform survey that we've been uh, looking at, uh, but you'll be able to attest to certain items, including AC3 appointments outside business hours, which means you have to uh, indicate whether or not you're doing this, uh, and since it's core, you have to actually be doing it. Um, however, you don't have to provide documentation. You can simply attest to it. So let's look at AC3. Again, we've got a documented process and evidence of implementation. But in this case, I don't, because I, I'm previously recognized, um, I don't need to provide evidence. So I can actually attest to this. Well, how would I do that? I would click Add New Evidence here, and I would choose the text option. Notice I can choose a document, I can choose text, or I can put in a website. So I'm going to enter my name for this evidence. It's going to be my attestation. And I'm going to say, I am level 2, 2014, and don't need to provide evidence. We actually have more formal language that we'd like you to use, but let's just go with this for, for now. And I'm going to save that. That is actually a piece of evidence, which means I've attested to this and I'm done with this. I would, I would click that as ready for check-in. I also want to attest to the evidence of implementation since I'm doing this. So I would link evidence again. I would put in the name attestation and I can just click on that. So you only actually have to put your attestation in once and then you can actually attach it, or uh, as if it were a piece of evidence, uh, to each of the items that you can attest to. So again, I've got two more items ready for check-in. So now that you've actually added evidence and uh, identified that there are criteria that are ready for check-in, uh, I'm going to show you how you actually will schedule a formal check-in or what is basically a request for NCQA to review your documentation and evidence uh, and determine whether or not you meet the criteria. So I'm here looking at my evaluations on my home page and I'm going to go to my production test site B. I'll go to my program dashboard and to the evaluation. Now, at this point, I've already checked in a number of, or I have a number of criteria that I've identified as ready for check-in. Uh, and as I mentioned before, that's the equivalent of putting items into a shopping basket on an online shopping site. Uh, but the checking in components for review, which is what I'm going to do now, is the equivalent of actually checking out uh, when you're buying items. So I'm going to click check in components for review, uh, and the screen will actually show me all the items that I have identified as ready for check in. That is, the, these are the items that I'm actually uh, saying to NCQA. I would like to have reviewed. And if you notice, it will tell me on the right whether or not it's a virtual review uh, or if I have um, uh, documents attached. Um, and so I do have um, uh, all of these items ready, ready to go. Some of them I'll be doing virtual reviews on. Some of them I will not. 
Uh, so now I want to confirm the check-in, and the screen will show me the date 30 days from now, because we want to give the reviewer at least 30 days to be able to review all the documentation that you've uploaded before you actually meet with the reviewer on the virtual review and, um, and actually show them the evidence in terms of demonstrations and reports. So you'll actually pick a time uh, for your uh, first virtual review, say we're going to do it Thursday at 11 o'clock Eastern. It'll automatically show a two-hour block because we need to have at least two hours for the review. Once you've decided on your times, uh, click Select and Confirm, and you'll have one more confirmation. You can always cancel at this point if you don't want to schedule the review, uh, but once you confirm, you will have scheduled your check-in at this time. And you can see it will tell you that you've checked in your components and the evaluator is currently reviewing your evidence. If I go back to the evaluation now and actually look at some of the items that I've uh, now checked in and asked NCQA to review, um, I'm going to go to uh, Access Core. Notice it will say it's checked in and it is now locked. I can't get into the system. Uh, I can see what is going on uh, with the criteria, but because it is checked in uh, and it's being reviewed, I can't alter any of the evidence at this time. I won't be able to until the reviewer completes their review. Now the final thing I want to show you is the preliminary results screen. So if I click on this, it will actually show me in a tree form what actually has been met and what has not been met. Notice the insignia for not met is a, is a thumbs down and because I've just checked in uh, at this point I have not met um, most of the criteria but if I click on core for instance it will tell me uh, which of the core criteria and then I can actually look and see which have been met and which have not been met. Um, as the reviewer actually identifies uh, criteria as being met or not met you'll actually see these results change and over time uh, you'll see green uh, and the met insignia when the reviewer actually tells you that you've met criteria.